It is nine o'clock, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and welcome to our expert roundtable, the Batteries Regulation, Innovation Catalyst or Development Show. Jointly organized by Recharge, the European Industry Association of the Advanced Rechargeable and Lithium Battery Value Chain, and Battery 2030 Plus, Europe's large scale research initiative for inventing the batteries of the future. As you probably know, on December 10th, 2020, the European Commission published a proposal for a battery regulation with the aim of paving the way for sustainable batteries for a circular and climate neutral economy. Paramount for the further development of the European battery value chain, the Commission proposal introduced things like carbon intensity, due diligence measures, as new key sustainability pillars to accelerate the transition transition to low carbon and responsible products. Regulated design conditions for second life and the right to repair are among the other novelties in the EU legislative response to the European vision of batteries made in Europe. In this virtual event today, research industry experts will elaborate on the potential of the proposed battery regulation for product development innovation and the EU chances of success in the race for the next generation battery technology. My name is Amelie Sophie Zalau, and it's my pleasure to guide you through this event today. To set the scene, our keynote speakers from the industry, academia, and the European Commission will start with their opening remarks. We will then open our interactive expert roundtable, and we want to invite you to please actively contribute to this. Please send us your questions through the Q&A function and we will take those up. We will then end our event with a closing statement provided by the European Battery Partnership Association, BIPA, which was established at the end of 2020 to gather, organize and drive the European research development and innovation agenda under Horizon Europe. And now, a little bit of housekeeping. So dear audience, please bear in mind that this event is recorded and that this event video will be shared externally afterwards. And also if you want to tweet about this event or follow us online, please make use of our event hashtags. So it's hashtag batteries for EU and hashtag EU Green Week. And uh, it's now my pleasure to open the floor or as it is virtual, rather our screens, to our keynote speakers. We will start with Dr. Claude Chanson, General Manager at Battery Industry Association Recharge. Then we will have Dr. Johan Blondel from the European Commission's DJ for Research and Innovation, and Dr. Simon Perrault, Deputy Director and French Research Institute, Sera Gitten, and member of Battery 2030 Plus. Um, so I think I have spoken enough, but uh, we will have a little bit more. So as the European voice of the advanced rechargeable and lithium battery value chain, Recharge represents key actors of the European battery ecosystem and contributes with both industry expertise and industry recommendations to the EU battery roads currently under work. Dr. Claude Chanson is a chemist and long time battery expert with over 30 years of industry expertise. Thank you, Claude, for joining the debate today and providing the industry view on the innovation and development potential of the proposed batteries, battery regulation. So Claude, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amelie Sophie, and good morning, everybody. And thank you for everybody tuning in in today's uh, online roundtable for this innovation potential analysis of the new uh, commission proposal for the batteries regulation. Uh, as an industry, of course, we welcome very much that work of the commission, uh, the, the work which was done to prepare this proposal of regulation. And uh, we believe in the strong potential that this regulation has to support the development of the European battery industry. Uh, we have, we consider, of course, that draft batteries regulation is a pivotal tool to establish uh, both sustainability standards uh, and level playing field for all the batteries that would be placed uh, on the market and therefore enabling 
a strong and long standing competition for the European ecosystem. Uh, we, of course, expect that these rules uh, implemented uh, by the new regulation have uh, the right uh, technical background and the political balance that uh, would enable the, the fast and the strong development of the European industry. Well, we, of course, as an industry, expect that uh, the, the support or, or the ecosystem for the research is strongly developing in Europe. Uh, as an industry, we need, in fact, this uh, framework to have funding and research environmental, uh, sorry, research environment capable of developing the most uh, promising innovation and, and the future as we expect it from the new and future technologies of batteries. And on the other end, we also expect this uh, legislative framework to be capable of strengthening uh, the competitive points, the unique selling points of the uh, European industry about responsibility, sustainability, and uh, customization of products that uh, will make the industry very competitive. So to the first point about the uh, research environment, uh, we see already a very lively and uh, more than promising uh, research and development community. And uh, we have uh, already uh, seen with these uh, batteries 2030 plus, particularly uh, a large organization group, um, have a lot of the community being gathering uh, to, together. Uh, we have seen the investment supporting this. The, the real content for new projects uh, are uh, taking speed, and I believe the, the, our commission speaker will, uh, will elaborate more on this. And this is for the, the very important aspect of creating a dynamics for research and, and future project development in Europe. Now, coming to the second point about the legislative framework, uh, we have uh, now as I said, a very, uh, let's say, important uh, new aspects that are brought in by this new regulation, like the carbon footprint, as was uh, mentioned, or the uh, due diligence requirements. And we believe these are very uh, important new pillars of the uh, competitiveness of the European industry. But we also see in this very complex regulation uh, potential uh, throwbacks of the efforts of the European industry, or uh, maybe uh, on number of subjects, uh, which could be critical for innovation and product development. We believe we, we see uh, maybe too, uh, too many controls and obligations attached to this regulation. And uh, that could be considered, let's say, as a kind of micromanagement of uh, what the development of the batteries industry should be, uh, particularly when it's come to some description of target or obligations, which could be considered as too technology specific, too much focus on the existing chemistries and not enough on the future one, or uh, also maybe not reflecting the possibility for the research and then the industry to uh, quickly move on innovation and the change in technologies, uh, which indeed is what we expect from a dynamic uh, sector. So we need indeed to clarify and work towards these uh, essential points of the policy objectives to make sure that uh, this new regulation uh, can be used in a way to uh, really support the development and, uh, and the agility of the research uh, in this uh, new European ecosystem, which is still uh, under construction, uh, both from the point of view of industry and from the point of view of research. And therefore, I look forward to our expert panel to really address these questions on uh, how the battery regulation can deal uh, with material innovation uh, design innovation, also application innovation, and finally also uh, recycling innovation. So uh, I think that are the, the key points of our interest as an industry in this uh, new regulation coming up. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope that you will enjoy our event. 
Thank you, Claude. And uh, now we will continue, and it's an honor for me to welcome Dr. Johan Blondel from the European Commission's DG for Research and Innovation. Johan Blondel works in the DG Research and Innovation on future urban and mobility systems, where he is currently setting up the battery partnership under Horizon Europe. He is holding a PhD in optoelectronics. He joined the Commission over 15 years ago and has since been contributing to the creation and extension of different partnerships in the transport and energy sector. Johan, thank you for joining us today and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. And um, again, thank you for, for the invitation uh, to speak at this event. So I was asked to say a few words on how the battery regulation affects battery research and how this is articulated through the partnership that uh, is going to start in a couple of days. Well, spoiler alert, uh, the two really go hand in hand and everything goes back to the Battery Alliance, which was established in 2017. This Battery Alliance identified six main areas of impact uh, one of those was to create the right environment to um, um, set up a sustainable battery manufacturing industry. And this was implemented through the new batteries regulation that we are uh, discussing today. So as already mentioned, there is a, a very strong emphasis in this battery regulation on sustainability and the safety requirements for batteries performance and durability, but very importantly, end of life management, recycling and the materials uh, recovery. So all of these themes are very prominent in the new uh, batteries uh, regulation, and we will probably discuss them uh, in the course of this session. Now, another area of impact that was identified by the Battery Alliance was to invest heavily in research and innovation in order to build up the competitiveness of the European battery sector. And we have chosen to implement this through a partnership between the private sector and the public sector, so uh, the European Commission. A partnership guarantees really an increased stability and predictability for the entire sector. So it creates a good environment to invest long-term into uh, research and innovation. It also sets up a framework with a coordinated and an agreed multi-annual planning. And there is a very strong interaction between the private and the public sector on uh, the work program and the activities of this uh, partnership. Now, partnerships are part of a new approach. And uh, you know that we are now launching Horizon Europe, the new framework uh, program for research. And this counts no less than 49 partnerships. 11 of those fall under cluster five, which is on climate, energy, and mobility. And the commission vision is really to have strong synergies between all of the partnerships. So to have a lot of interaction between them, to build a community, and to also rely on the partnerships to provide feedback on policy aspects like regulation, standardization, safety, and so on. As I already indicated, the partnership really goes hand in hand with the regulation. It is very ambitious. It uh, has a total EU budget of 925 million euros. And this is almost double of what has been invested in battery research since FP7. Uh, what is more important and what is new, though, is that its scope now covers the entire value chain of batteries. So really from the cradle to the grave, from raw materials and processing down to recycling and sustainability is really a key part in all of the activities of uh, the partnership. As such, of course, it is also aligned with the Green Deal because it provides the supporting technologies that will help us cut the greenhouse gases and it reduces uh, the, the impact on uh, resources that is uh, decoupled from economic growth. So where are we now with this partnership? Um, we are going to sign the memorandum of understanding between the private and the public side on the 23rd of June. And this happens in a ceremony uh, within the framework of the research and innovation days. 
So on commission side, there will be no less than five commissioners signing this memorandum of understanding. The private side will be represented by Michael Lippert, uh, who will, we'll hear at the end of uh, the session. He represents BEPA, the Batteries European Partnership As Association, which is the Commission's counterpart. It is a grouping of around 145 members, and it's really equally split between industry and research. So there will be a very strong interaction between the Batteries Partnership and other partnerships because we will develop the core technologies but then applications will be taken up in other partnerships and there will also be strong interactions regarding development of skills and market uh, deployment now the first concrete action of this partnership is the launch of its first work program this happens on the 24th of june so just a day after a signature for a budget of 160 million euros the next call is following then in April of 2022 for 133 million and so on and so forth, annual calls until 2027. So in conclusion, the batteries regulation and the batteries partnership are two sides of the same coin and they are implementing the batteries alliance. Thank you very much for your attention and good luck with uh, the rest of the session. Thank you so much for those insights. And last but not certainly least, I would like to invite now the voice of the academic side to the discussion. And this is Dr. Simon Perrault from the French Research Institute, Sierra Liten, and member of Battery 2030 Plus. He has been researching into the development of innovating technologies for the energy transition for many years. Uh, Simon holds a PhD in physics and is part of the executive board of the European Battery Partnership Association. Thank you for being with us today, uh, Simon, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here with you uh, for this um, very interesting event on the uh, upcoming battery regulation. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, Recharge and Battery 2030 Plus for for setting up this, uh, this webinar and uh, inviting me uh, today. So um, as an introduction, I would like to, to say a, a few words about uh, Battery 2030 Plus and uh, explain a little bit what it is uh, about. Uh, well, Battery 2030 Plus is, um, is a research initiative uh, that was launched around um, three years ago uh, by a group of uh, universities and research organizations and uh, also uh, industry associations uh, uh, such as Recharge uh, with the support of the European Commission. And this uh, Battery 2030 Plus initiative uh, aims at uh, promoting long-term research in Europe in the field of batteries. So what we did first um, is to publish a manifesto uh, this was published uh, two years ago, and in, the, in this manifesto, we, we explained uh, why long-term research in the field of batteries is, uh, is crucial, is important for Europe. Then, uh, a, little bit, a little bit after that, we, uh, we prepared, we, start, uh, we started preparing a roadmap uh, that was, that was uh, published um, uh, last year, in 2020. And in this roadmap, we, uh, we, we tried to identify uh, key research areas, long-term research areas, where Europe can make a difference. Uh, in particular, in this roadmap, we, uh, we, um, we described uh, research areas such as um, materials acceleration platform, uh, which are new tools and methods based on artificial intelligence to accelerate the discovery of new materials and to engineer battery materials and battery interfaces. In the roadmap, we discussed also about uh, smart battery cells, where um, sensors and smart functionalities such as uh, smart feeling, uh, cell feeling uh, functionalities are integrated within battery cells and, and connected to uh, battery management systems. And, and we also talked about in this roadmap, um, uh, we talked about uh, some cross-cutting uh, aspects such as uh, 
manufacturability and, and recyclability. Um, but battery 2030 plus is not only about a roadmap, it's, uh, it's also uh, a portfolio of actual research projects. Uh, today, we have uh, seven research projects, which are part of the, the battery 2030 plus portfolio. These projects are funded uh, under Horizon 2020. And uh, they are closely collaborating together to, uh, to implement uh, the, the roadmap. Uh, hopefully, in the in the coming years, uh, other projects will be uh, will be funded and supported, um, and and will join the, the battery 2030 plus portfolio. Uh, in particular, projects that will be uh, supported by the uh, upcoming uh, uh, battery partnership that uh, Johan has uh, has described. Um, so this is about battery 2030 plus. Now, what what is the link with the uh, with the battery regulation? Um, so um, I, I think that, uh, that Battery 2030 Plus and uh, actually the other uh, research initiatives or research projects uh, uh, at the European level are uh, result oriented. What we want at the end of the day is to, to, to bring uh, differentiating technologies to the European industry. And to do that, we need to have uh, targets, we need to have uh, directions. Uh, for example, uh, targets about battery performances, about uh, battery durability, but also about uh, en environmental sustainability, about uh, safety, about cost. And this uh, new battery regulation will uh, contribute uh, to some extent to uh, identify and to highlight some uh, of these uh, general targets. And this will help, at the end of the day, this will help the, the research community to, to, uh, to identify the, the direction that we should uh, aim at. Uh, I will not say uh, much more about that because I'm sure that in the uh, roundtable that will uh, follow, um, uh, these uh, topics will be discussed. So. Um, uh, thank you very much for your attention and uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Claude, Johan and Simon for these more than insightful introductory words. We heard a lot about sustainability and the future and upcoming research. And I think this sets the scene very well for our next program step, that is the expert round table. But before we start with the expert roundtable, I just want to remind our audience again to seize the opportunity and submit questions to our battery experts. So please feel free to send us your questions. And now please join with me in welcoming Professor Christina Edström from Uppsala University and coordinator of Battery 2030 Plus. Dr. Wolfgang Weidsanz from German Consumer Goods and Mobility Solutions provider Bosch. Dr. Jan Titgart from Materials Manufacturer and Recycler Umicore. Dr. Annika Titbald from Car Manufacturer Volvo. Dr. Fabrice Mathieu from the European Commission's Joint Research Center. And Dr. Claude Chanson from Recharge. And I'm really sorry, but uh, my camera seems to have some problems, but that uh, won't bother us. And we will start with a question to the whole group. Um, so how does each of you see the role and impact of the battery regulation on product development, especially when we are looking at sectors such as e-mobility, as well as on battery innovation? And here we are speaking about materials, chemistries, and also about design. So perhaps we can just start the discussion with the academia. Christina, please. Thank you so much. Yes, um, this battery regulation opens up for many new research questions and uh, both a fundamental character and applied character. And uh, when you look at the whole value chain, how you make a battery from the materials all the way to a process to make the cell, and then you have to use these cells, you can find that each step needs its own attention when it comes to reduce the need of energy, the need of water, the need, and also to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. 
what I as a scientist particularly like with the battery regulation is that science actually is free. I'm allowed to do science on what I would like to do. It is sort of, it's not locking in the research part, but I'm worried that the regulation as such is locking in the chemistries they are thinking of, the, the uh, sort of system they're building up and forcing the industry to go to. So I'm worried that there will not be enough funding opportunities for the blue sky rocket science that you actually also need for the inventions of the future. There is sort of a, a reason why Battery 2030 Plus exists, and this is to take everything a little bit longer. But if we come up with these very new, novel, hopefully more sustainable ideas, will then the industry and the policy makers take it up? Will it sort of be possible or will it be just a deadline? That, that's risk I see. Um, but I also see that um, all the applied and uh, the fundamental research as such, uh, um, that this sort of regulation implicitly means uh, and leads to, uh, needs uh, to address, be addressed. And uh, I can just give you one example. If we want to recover 85% of the lithium from a lithium battery in a recycling process, how would you actually do that? Because this little metal sits wherever it wants in this structure. These these kind of questions you you, uh, you have as a scientist. So I think uh, that's my take home message for uh, for the funding agency, but also from industry. Also allow a little bit of blue rocket sky risky research. I mean, if we had continued to polish the candlelight, we wouldn't have electricity today. So this is my message. Thank you, Christina. Now we will continue with the industry. So Jan, please, if you want to give us your statement. Yeah, good morning. And uh, I, I like the reference to the candlelight, Christina. Indeed, uh, we need uh, fundamental research and, and to improve and, and to look really on the on the longer term. Uh, but as an industry, uh, we, we try to play, of course, on, on both legs. Huh? So development of, of uh, existing technologies and, and improving, etc. But also looking forward to the next uh, generations. Uh, but maybe um, Numico is a materials technology and recycling company, so I would like to make a few remarks uh, from these two perspectives, so from materials production and from uh, recycling. So let me say, uh, overall, we are happy with the proposal from the Commission. Uh, we want to congratulate the Commission with the work they have done. It contains a lot of uh, provisions to make uh, the battery uh, development and, and, and industry in Europe uh, sustainable. And it starts indeed with the uh, uh, the sourcing of the raw materials. Uh, where we see uh, due diligence obligations. Uh, we are happy to see that. Uh, we only have the question why they limit that to, um, to to battery materials for electric vehicles and industrial batteries. Why not including the uh, batteries for electronics? Um, from the perspective of innovation, um, it's maybe not technical innovation, although uh, we see that there's uh, a lot of, of things to do uh, to improve, for instance, the artisanal small mining to make it more uh, robust, to make it more uh, eco-friendly, to make it more uh, safe at uh, the first place uh, for, for the operators. Uh, so to, uh, to make sure that uh, all the, 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 the materials that come to us uh, are indeed uh, produced in environmentally sound conditions, in uh, social acceptable conditions, and uh, with the governance that is uh, also acceptable for, for our uh, society. Uh, then looking at the production phase, uh, so there we see uh, provisions on uh, the carbon footprint. Uh, we think indeed this is a new industry that we have to develop in Europe. Uh, we should do it from the first time good. Uh, so uh, the first phase will be reporting on, on uh, footprint, but then it will be uh, also with a cap. Uh, so that means that we will have to review existing uh, processes and to, to look at how we can uh, systematically reduce the footprint of the materials uh, that we produce. And then looking at the end, uh, so maybe uh, our colleague Wolfgang will talk more about the use phase, but if we look at, at the end of life, uh, so even at the end of the second life, uh, uh, we are um, looking at, at the recycling and the collection. Uh, so we see that there are collection targets which are 
increased. So for the portable batteries, the, the, the number will increase from 45 gradually to 70. Uh, but practice today is that for a portable rechargeable batteries, even if we have already for many years a target of 45%, uh, we see that merely 10% uh, of the lithium ion batteries from electronics are coming back to recycling. So despite uh, ambitious targets, uh, the reality on the floor, on the ground is, is, is not that good. So there, we also have to be innovative to see what we can do to increase the collection in practice. For the industrial batteries and automotive batteries, uh, there is an, a no leakage policy. And there, a crucial element is the provision of uh, equivalent conditions. So exports of batteries uh, to, to non-EU countries uh, would have to happen under, uh, for recycling has to happen under equivalent conditions. But also that provision already exists for many, many years. But nobody can explain me what are those conditions that have to be equivalent. And so also there, we have to look what what it really does mean and how we can make sure that those conditions are equivalent. Uh, then something new, it's uh, the material recovery targets. So for uh, some selected elements from the battery, uh, uh, there will be uh, recovery yields. So how much really do you recover? Uh, we think that it's a good idea to focus on really important elements and so not to achieve the overall recycling efficiency by recycling a lot of oxygen, uh, but to, to really look at an element like lithium, uh, despite the name lithium is only a few percent uh, in a lithium ion battery, but there's a critical raw material. So it's better to focus on those elements which are really critical than to focus on the abundant elements which contribute a lot to the overall uh, recycling efficiency. Uh, some people will say that the target for, especially for lithium, is too little, too late. Uh, but there we have to make a an, 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 uh, remark that uh, lithium recycling today in Europe is really something that still has to be developed. Uh, so uh, we do not know really where we are, what we can do, what we can commit. Uh, of course, it's important that the Commission gives a direction that they say, okay, this is indeed an important element and we have to recycle it. Uh, but we have to avoid that we would simply do a kind of concentration of the lithium in, in an intermediate fraction and then that that fraction would be exported to China where there is already an existing lithium refinery industry available. So we have really to see if the, the timelines and, and the objectives are in line with the, the technology uh, development. <clears throat> And then there is another uh, provision, and it's the recycled contents that's also new. Uh, there we are really wondering uh, what is the added value? Uh, because if it's aiming for more recycling, then we say, well, look at the collection targets and the no leakage policy. And if it is uh, focusing on, on quality of recycling, then we say, well, why can't we use the uh, recycling efficiency and uh, the material recovery rates as a, as a quality indicator and to improve those uh, definitions to make sure that the quality is guaranteed uh, from that perspective. And it's important, we think as an industry, it's important to focus more on the collection and recycling targets than on the recycled content targets, because um, there is the difference between uh, battery manufacturers in Europe and battery producers. The producers, that's the companies that put the batteries on the market. And today, a lot of those producers are non-Europeans. And those non-European battery producers, they contribute also to the costs and, and the for collection and recycling, whereas the battery producers or manufacturers in Europe, if they have to uh, make sure that the collection and the recycling is increased, then the costs maybe uh, will be allocated much more to the European manufacturers instead of to the worldwide uh, producers. And so that's something uh, to pay attention and to make sure that those recycling uh, targets or, or recycled content targets are well defined and in balance with the market situation. So, thank you. Thank you, Jan. And our next speaker will be Wolfgang. And uh, please stick to the two minutes so that everybody gets the chance to, to speak and that we also have enough time for the questions at the end. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Emily. I will try. Um, yeah, good morning also from myself. Um, I'm from Bosch Consumer Products, as you mentioned already, and we very much uh, value the circularity approach and also the sustainability approach uh, that is in the new battery regulation. That's topics that are coming up now, and they are uh, very good. Uh, Bosch is, I think, a forerunner in this point, and we have uh, been very sustainable for years. 
Um, materials recycling is very appreciated. We know from, for example, lead acid batteries where worn out lead acid batteries are, are of little or no use to the end customer, um, that the recycling works very well. We can get the lead back, we can put it back into applications. Um, the same is partially or is uh, generally true also for example for lithium ion batteries but Jan has talked a lot about that uh, we have to all, uh, only be careful that uh, when we say we extend the lifetime which is very good and uh, we do very sustainable long life products uh, at Bosch uh, then the batteries come back only after a long time and uh, for example for e-mobility or even uh, e-packs electric pedal assist bikes we see that this is 10 years or more and then we have the resources in the cycle for 10 years uh, if we do second life they stay even longer before they are uh, back and are ready for uh, collecting and recycling um, the uh, other thing is that basically when we talk about consumer applications everything where the consumer has control of the battery uh, in an electric vehicle, this is only partially the case because the battery is not uh, dealt with by the consumer directly. But in other applications where he daily handles it, where he buys it, where he exchanges it, where he uh, brings it back or recycles it or maybe hoards it or maybe even uh, unfortunately uh, improperly disposes of it, we will not get the resources back and we need a lot of uh, education there and we need the effort from all sides. This can't be only an industry topic. Uh, we will do our fair share, but we need also the consumer in the boat who really has the control of the batteries to bring it back and then bring it back into the circle. And as Jan said, uh, get the resources back, get the um, materials back. Um, this is especially for strong growing markets. We need some available for collection mechanism, which we are currently missing, but uh, the um, commission has so seen that and they are um, initiating research. So this will be done to consider the lifetime uh, of the battery. And this is really good. If the battery is uh, alive for 10 years, this is of course beneficial. Uh, just a few thoughts and I will pass on to the next speaker, not to be over time too much. Okay, thank you. Annika, the stage is yours. Thank you, Emily. So at Volvo Cars, we take sustainability very seriously and the climate action has the highest priority on our, in our sustainability strategy. And I think this has been seen and can be seen uh, by the uh, ambitious uh, sustainability targets that we have set for ourselves, uh, which include that our business will be carbon neutral by 2040 and the, some of the milestones on the way, for example, that 50% of new car sales uh, will be electric in 2025 and 100% by 2030. And I also think this is a good time to remind you that Volvo cars were actually first uh, of the automotive makers to introduce blockchain as a, as a tool for sustainable and ethical uh, cobalt sourcing. And this is a tool that we are continually working with and we are expanding to broaden that to include more materials. So uh, from that sense, we very much welcome a battery regulation that can support sustainable development in uh, Europe. At the same time, we think it is important that such a regulation is technology neutral and that it stimulates innovation rather than imposes technology restrictions that can hinder the um, uptake of advances and in new insights that come from research. And we see a, a big risk of this, as Christina stated earlier in her talk, that we are the, the current proposal is, is very much focused on existing technologies and not uh, leaving much room for, for um, the, the, new, the new things to come. Uh, so, I, here, I think it's very important that the uh, to work together with all stakeholders to strike a right balance for this regulation, so that we we can take advantage of innovation, we can continue to develop the technology, make products better, and at the same time drive sustainability forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are now 
leaving the industry uh, and uh, I will ask Fabrice, Fabrice for his statement. Thank you. Yes, good morning, everyone. And thank you for the organizers to invite uh, the GSC. So it will be quite difficult to be original after all these statements, but I'll try. Uh, first of all, uh, a preamble uh, saying two things. First of all, this regulation is also an innovation. Huh? Uh, it's the first time that we've got so many performance and sustainability aspects addressed in a single regulation. So of course, it requires a bit of also uh, policy innovations, that's the first thing. And this regulation also can be seen as an innovation for the consumers or the citizen. Huh? They will have more transparency uh, on the product, uh, on the value chain uh, for a product that they, that they value. Now, if I come back to the question, which is on innovation for, for industry, for the value chain, then we would see um, at the GSC three types of innovation. The, the most of us one is, of course, uh, product and process innovations at all the stages of, of the value chain. Uh, of course, if you want to improve the battery performances, not only at the product, but at the system level, you will need innovation for sure. Um, if you want to have performing batteries with uh, good durability, you will need innovation as well. If you want to use recycled materials, it will be a kind of technical challenge as was already uh, underlined and that will require innovation. Uh, and of course, it will have also recycling innovations. And, and, and if you want to also address all these aspects together, then you will have also to be a bit creative when, when, when managing uh, all the trade-offs between the, these aspects. So definitely it's, it's a push for, for innovation in, in, for product and process innovation. That's, that's quite obvious and that's quite, um, in line with what was said. We see all the types of innovation. There is definitely also a transformation in the industrial organization. Now recyclers will not be any more contractors at the end of life, but they can also become suppliers. So they are changing a bit the picture. It's, it's, it's having an impact on, on, the, on the overall industrial organization. And I would see also a, a third type of innovation, which is what I would call accompanying activities. Uh, we'll need more information, more data, more expertise on life cycle uh, business, on data, on methods, uh, etc. But that's for the carbon footprint, for example, but also more information on the available second raw materials available in the urban mine. So, and we have also good. We need also good uh, monitoring indicators to follow all the all the, the behavior of the system. So, I see as well uh, a, a big big innovations uh, a bit also for this this topic. So, in a nutshell, and you wouldn't be surprised because it's coming from the research center of the commission. We see many positive impacts uh, on innovation of, of this regulation. Thank you, that's all for the moment, thanks. Thank you very much. And Claude, please, for the last two minutes before we start with the question, and I just want to remind the audience to please submit the question through the Q&A function so that we cannot miss it. Thank you. Claude, up to you. Yes, thank you. And uh, as I also made an introductory statement, I will just uh, maybe continue on what Fabrice just said about innovation uh, by design of the new uh, regulation and. Uh, the requirement innovation. And I, I agree on this. Uh, I would anyway remind that the, the industry concern is that this would be, let's say, too much be fixed based on existing technologies or what we know. And of course, it is more difficult to define the future. That's what's uh, at stake with the research. Um, uh, how to uh, make sure that future products will be sustainable and how to make sure that the existing product like lithium batteries today will be produced under sustainable ways. And my point here is will be very simple. My understanding is that there is a need for research, uh, let's say driving lines to be at a high level enough to support general concepts. What means sustainability? Is it more about the very material you are using like lithium or copper and so on? Or is it about the impact of these materials on the uh, resource usage or the carbon footprint? And that would be high level principle. And that's also why we like as an industry, the carbon footprint development. We know, by the way, as you mentioned Fabrice, there is of course need of further development in the carbon footprint. We know these are technical tools that need to be refinement and precision and so on. But we are very much supportive because they address fundamental principle about the global impact on our uh, global warming risk. When it comes to, uh, for example, the questions about recycling that was strongly addressed by, by uh, uh, Jan and Wolfgang, we believe that we should here also address high level challenges like making available materials important for the circular economy 
making sure that the quality of recycling in general principle is respected. And here maybe also research could be useful, but maybe uh, for this regulation less to focus on, let's say, uh, close or too close to the market or too close to the uh, practical solutions. Uh, these uh, regulation rules um, to which indeed uh, at that point may limit the freedom and, and vision for research to develop in the future systems. So that would be my main message. Thank you, uh, Amelie. Thank you very much. And as the statements were a little bit longer as we thought, we will directly deep dive with the questions uh, from the audience. Thank you for those. And the first question is, um, the proposal for the battery regulation is highly complex and many insecurities due to the many delegated acts. How will this be an advantage for EU industry to compete with Asia? So that's a very difficult question, and I think it's going in the direction of the research center and the industry. So please go ahead if you have the answer. So um, Amelie, this, uh, if I may, I, I would like to start on this. And I fully agree that the uh, proposal on the table is very complex with the many delegated acts, which makes it actually very difficult to assess what the impact is going to be. And also the, the timeline of uh, introduction is, is very short and very compressed, which makes that even more challenging. I think maybe uh, it is difficult to, to appreciate how long some of the development uh, time, uh, times are in the industry and how long in advance that we set up our supply chains, et cetera, which means that having 12 months in, in between a, a final decision on what we actually have to comply with and what uh, uh, is, is, an, is very challenging. And I think this needs to be respected. Otherwise, we, we, we can see a big risk that, that the industry is really going to be uh, struggling and uh, there can also be potential bottlenecks and, and uh, delays caused by this proposal. Um, and coming back, uh, I think, again, because the regulation is so complex, it covers everything basically from mining and, uh, and material, raw, very basic raw material refining to advanced products to uh, end of life considerations. And here it's very important to work together with all the stakeholders so that we strike a correct balance. So it doesn't become over prescriptive, doesn't become limiting, but actually enables and opens up possibilities and room for continued development, both in research, in, in, in the industry, as well as on the market. And so um, I, I my personal view is I think that there is a need for some simplification in the proposal to make this more manageable for everyone that uh, it will apply to. Thank you so much, Annika. And I have a further question for Jan, and that is how big is the share of used batteries raw material that are realistically expected to be used as new material in production of new batteries given the challenges with getting enough purity and other challenges? Yeah, that, that's indeed an, an, uh, uh, the one million question. Huh? Uh, the more longer the batteries live, the more uh, second life applications there will be, the less uh, products will be available uh, for recycled content and, and contributing to uh, the resilience that we all want to achieve with uh, access to raw materials. Uh, so, but uh, there are uh, prognoses, uh, so um, uh, significant use of, raw of recycled raw materials uh, will only be within 10, 15 years from now. Huh? So uh, the lifetime, luckily, the lifetime of those uh, EV batteries is quite long. So 10 to 12, 15 years is not exceptional, especially if you add indeed that uh, second life aspect. So really thinking that we will have significant volumes to be recycled in 10, 15 years, well, uh, you know what's on the market today. Uh, and, and you look at the prognosis of what will be sold in 2035, uh, then you, you have a ratio of maybe uh, less than, than 10%. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is also a significant part of um, production scrap. 
And so uh, if you look at the, the production cycle, and of course also there, the objective is to reduce the production scrap, eh? so not to reject uh, materials that are in the phase of production. And so there, there could be maybe, uh, so far we have to recycle that, and that can contribute already from the uh, very beginning. Uh, but um, yeah, the, this, these timelines, uh, we have to build a stock in the economy before we can really significant uh, recycle. Okay, thank you. And now I have a question for Wolfgang, and that's also, I think, one of the one million questions is how much impact factor of additives making longer battery life? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I think uh, we can with additives and we have learned, especially in the lithium ion, but also in lead acid industry, um, to extend the life of batteries also by additives, not only, but also by additives. Uh, and we see that today we have uh, very good lifetimes. Um, lead acid batteries, the lifetime has been extended greatly uh, for the nickel systems. The lifetime, they were very sturdy, especially nickel cadmium, which for good reasons, uh, because of the cadmium is not uh, greatly on the market anymore. But also for lithium, the additives can uh, extend the lifetime, but we have a very good lifetime today. Uh, as we've heard, we have many applications where the lifetime can be 10, 15, maybe even 20 years for the EV, for stationary, also for our EPACs, that is a very good lifetime. So maybe this is not the limiting factor. Um, and yeah, the whole industry has learned over the last, let's say, decade, especially the lithium industry, to make very sturdy, long life uh, batteries. And for many applications, uh, the lifetime, especially the cycle lifetime, uh, is very well sufficient for the application. And now I have a question on carbon footprint, and it's perhaps for Claude or Fabrice, and is the biggest challenge with the carbon footprint will be reliable data. How can we assure that we have a system that is one, reliable, two, implementable, and three, does not add more red tape to industry. Okay. Can I take it, Claude, or you take it? Yeah, <laughs> please start, if I was. Okay, thank you for the question. So indeed, it was say that uh, having high level objective is, is, is a good thing. I think I heard that uh, earlier, the carbon footprint is one of them. Uh, yes, um, it was a request from many people to have this uh, carbon footprint analysis. Uh, I think in my introductory talk that it will push a bit uh, the life cycle business, I would call it, on data, on tools, on methods, on reporting, etc. So first of all, the, the regulation is still a draft. It's being discussed at the moment. We're using the right policy channels. So let's see what, what comes out there. And of course, that's what I say in my first point, um, it will require a bit of innovation. So we are, we know that the implementation of the regulation will require to define the rules on that for the, the exact methods, exact data, the exact reporting um, methods and work is already starting uh, also in contact with, with industry. Um, and the GSC, by the way, will support this work. We are getting prepared. And, and the good thing is that we are actually building on existing uh, rules and methods, which is uh, the product and motor footprint for the, for the battery uh, product group. So yes, um, what I say, yes, there is a need for, for work on that, but we are, we are building on the existing good basis. Yeah, and maybe I could add uh, just uh, two words, to, just to say that uh, indeed we, uh, are as an industry very much supportive of this uh, approach of carbon footprint and therefore as an industry we are trying to organize we have made a set up again a technical secretariat to uh, to uh, revise the rules of the carbon footprint in, in the PEF uh, method and this uh, is based on the fact that as an industry of course we do have the process so we could provide the information as long as the regulation is just let's say enabling the right balance between the requirements to provide uh, auditable, uh, controllable data and the freedom of the industry, of course, to have competitive information not to be disclosed and uh, let's say make the right level of balance between the need of transparency and public information and the need of the industry to remain competitive and have, of course, uh, competitive information not being disclosed. I think this is an exercise where the PEF is indeed uh, 
a little bit challenging because there is a lot of requirement about detailed information and so on. But we are strongly believe that uh, with the support of the GRC, as mentioned by uh, Mathieu, we can uh, end up with a very uh, practical method to be set up in the coming years. Uh, I think Fabrice, you just waved. Do you, you want to add something on that question? Yes, please. Um, so we, I think we have addressed the question of, of uh, methods, data, reporting, etc. I would like to see the carbon footprint um, article a bit more for innovation. Huh? We we know that carbon footprint uh, is depending on energy, on materials, on many aspects along the value chain, and having quantitative objective and having the carbon footprint as a, as a target, as a competitive argument. Will will uh, will push innovation in in all the the aspects on huh? energy processes um, materials etc. So we I like I mean of course there are many questions on the carbon footprint but we need to see that as a as a push for for technological innovation. So I, I want to highlight that as well. Huh? It's not just for the pleasure to have innovation to report to reporting. It's 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 there to 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 have a a, a low um, a more a low carbon value chain. Thank you, Fabrice. And perhaps we just uh, could have a look uh, on the university. So, uh, Christina, I, we don't want to forget you in that discussion. So, Thank what is your view on the university on all those topics? I think this is an extremely important question. How do we deal with data? How we, do we make databases that are reliable? And I agree with Fabrice. I think this carbon footprint uh, could drive that innovation. And that is actually one of the core topics of Battery 2030 Plus, that we actually do try to accelerate the finding of, of new materials and components and new batteries by, by for making open databases. And the question, an electronic notebooks, how to collect all the data uh, and uh, take the experimental part and marry it much better to the new digitalization tools so that we can actually have a, a reliable basis to do this. And just to make that infrastructure functioning uh, is a question in itself. And how you do that when you also want to safeguard innovations for industry, that you don't pick their golden nuggets and destroy that for them. That is really what we are putting up right now in Battery 2030 Plus. And then I'd like to mention that in some cases, I think we need to work more on the basic knowledge. And I'm thinking specifically on the life cycle analysis on the material side, the components uh, and the batteries Europe, the ETIP has therefore suggested an RNI action into the battery partnership, which was then taken more uh, of the partnership uh, comprising the automotives because it's also seen that we need to continue to work on on uh, life cycle analysis questions when it comes to automotives. So there's something coming up now in the, in the uh, coming uh, Horizon Europe program on this. And I think that's important. And then I want to say something about the additive question because we have additives in lithium ion batteries that actually helps the lifetime. And, but they, the percentage, the concentrations of these additives are so low that they don't really influence so much uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, recycling because it's other queen things in the batteries that are more important for the recycling. I think Jan was pu uh, pushing that, that we should be sort of concentrating on the important parts <laughs> that we need for recycling. Uh, and uh, if you want to look at the new chemistries that are much more unstable, but can give you more energy uh, we really need to work on the sustainability issues, the carbon dioxide footprint, and here the databases can help also to advance the new chemistries in, in a quicker way, I think, and that's my hope, and that's what the Battery 2030 roadmap is about. Thank you, Christina, and time is running, so we will go for another question, and if I ask you to answer very very uh, fast and with uh, uh, small um, sentences, that would be great, because I think it's a question for all of us. So there is a strong focus on batteries containing nickel and cobalt, and we are setting targets and requirements for a few metals only. Aren't we in consequence promoting to use other battery chemistries, which have lower recycling efficiencies, such as LFP, where recycling is still not solved? So. 
so I think a question for university, industry, and also for the recycling. So who wanna start? Hey. If you don't mind, um, I think that uh, the choice of battery materials is mainly driven by the performance. So if you look at the performance of uh, batteries containing nickel and uh, cobalt uh, compared to, to iron, uh, they have much more energy density. So the, the consumer might be interested in cheaper batteries if they perform sufficiently good. Uh, but um, if they need higher requirements, they will go to nickel cobalt because they are just performing better. And that's why it's important that we focus all our recycling to those metals that are indeed in, in a certain danger of, of availability. So it's more important to cover or to, to, to focus on nickel cobalt lithium recycling than, for instance, on iron recycling, which is much more abundant. And Annika, I think you also want to say yes, something. Yes, uh, I want to add to this because uh, the opposite could also happen, that because of the very high focus on nickel and cobalt, uh, it, it actually blocks for other chemistries to enter into the market. And the reason for this is that regardless of the chemistry, we still have to recycle. And if the, we don't have a recycling industry preparing to recycle other um, materials or and other cell chemistries, then we, we cannot use them. Uh, so, so these things are very, very tightly linked. And, and I think we have to be very cautious here about uh, what we are doing so that we are not setting up hurdles and obstacles and making also recycling of other chemistries that don't have the, the, the sort of high value uh, of nickel and cobalt where, and lithium where all the focus is that we don't uh, disadvantage them. Wolfgang, you also want to add something. Yeah, just add a, a few thoughts to what Jan and uh, Annika have said, which is uh, obviously very correct. Um, maybe when we talk about cobalt and nickel, we have to see that we bring the ba batteries with high cobalt content from years and maybe a decade ago back and get them back into the cycle recycle the cobalt as much as possible because that's also innovation and that's what we're talking about here uh, that we are reducing cobalt content for the future so with the batteries we bring back the kilowatt hour of lithium ion batteries from five or ten years ago we can build 10 kilowatt hours of co worth of cobalt in the future um, this is another aspect i think uh, lfp of course has other raw materials we are developing sodium ion batteries, which um, seems to have also maybe less uh, critical raw materials in them, but then they have a drawback in energy density, they have a drawback in other points, maybe advantages too. Uh, but I think the innovation is also that we uh, advance what we have today with lower cobalt content. Um, and bring that into future batteries too, and allow that in the regulation and allow that in research and in progress for the industry and for the consumer as uh, an effect as well. And I think we have one, two minutes left for the last question that's also a very interesting one. And this is, we see already today vehicle manufacturers developing in-house recycling capabilities but there are a very large number of batteries that are owned by third parties, dismantlers, insurance companies, etc. How can vehicle manufacturers or battery manufacturers get better access to these to be more circular? So perhaps it's a question for Annika and Wolfgang. I think this is um, a, a difficult question in, in many aspects. And I think it's also because it contains some, um, I would say commercial aspects here, because I think different manufacturers are approaching this in different ways and don't necessarily want to disclose these uh, in, in, in a forum like this. But of course, I think a, 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 a norm, a consequence of the battery regulation is that we also need to look at how the market is set up for recycling and ownership of batteries. And we and possibly uh, revise how things are done today to, to make these batteries more accessible uh, to the to the OEMs uh, because we are bound to to have these materials in our future cells and so we need to have access to them we cannot uh, let them go 
Wolfgang, yeah, I think it's it's a quite difficult question. Um, I see also a benefit if you have uh, large operators owning a lot of batteries, <laughs> because then they have a centralized control over the batteries, and this could uh, be a benefit for recycling, for bringing them back, for uh, having access to them at the end of life. As mentioned earlier, I think it's very important to get the batteries back at end of life, uh, and there are certain obstacles. Um, we have in some European countries very well working collection systems for portable batteries, which are the batteries that are at the end consumer, at the end customer. Um, and they work quite well. They have high recycling rates. We had a very good system in Germany, which is uh, now a little bit uh, watered down, let's say. Um, but we have to really educate the customer. We have to access the hoarding. Uh, if we don't get the batteries back, we can't simply recycle them. Um, recycling is another topic, but if we don't get the batteries back, there is no way um, to do anything with them. Um, so this is a common effort of everybody. Um, the systems are financed by putting the batteries on the market. The systems work quite well. Industry is very willing to uh, do its share, and we are doing a lot uh, in that field. We have contributed to these systems, but we have to also have the customer awareness to get the batteries back, and then uh, we can get the valuable resources back. I just want to add one final word here, and I think it's again an area of research. We need to get the, cost, the, the users on board, and I think this is an area for uh, behavioral research to look into how do we change people's ways of doing things. So this is, uh, and, and we are very technology focused here, but I do want to highlight also the human centric sides to this because we cannot uh, succeed without it. And I think Claude, you also yeah. want to. Yeah, maybe as, as an industry, I also would like to introduce something we like in the industry, which is the economic aspect. And indeed, when it comes to recycling, um, and having a lot of batteries being recycled, we could learn from uh, the uh, circular economy, which is in place for the lead acid batteries, where in fact, because of their value, the batteries are recycled. And we believe that uh, the development of the lithium battery industry, if of course it's uh, made on economical basis, uh, and that's where the regulation also could be uh, hindering this, but we uh, expect of course that due to the metal contains in lithium batteries, this business will become a positive business contributing to the circular economy. And in a circular economy, all the actors for the economy are, let's say, contributing and therefore making this uh, recycling of batteries uh, more of an objective rather than a burden. Thank you, Claude. And as we started with a statement of everybody, I think it would be nice if we close this round like this again. So I have a question for all of you, and that is, we may risk a bit of too much wishful thinking. The regulation is pushing for long use of battery goods over 10 years, while at the same time, any product in the market becomes obsolete or old fashioned in two or three years. We need a change in paradigm as consumers, otherwise high level regulation will not work alone. So Christina, what's your one minute statement to that? <laughs> That's a very complex question. And I can only say that, yes, the, uh, the products may change in a few years, but I don't think that will be so dramatically for many of the large investments like for the automotive industry or large scale storage. I'm more worried that uh, we don't take the uptake of the new possibilities that will come out uh, on research uh, side. And I also think that uh, we are so focused when we make our roadmaps and our expectations on the transportation sector, because that's the driver. And I think we need to think about batteries much broader. We need to use it for many other applications as well. And that opens up for a lot of new possibilities for other chemistries and lithium. And I think we should bear that in mind that in that respect, research is very important. And we will ask the same question to the industry. So Jan, Wolfgang and Annika, the stage is yours. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you. Um, I have another uh, perspective to look at that. Um, if 
people want to exchange their materials or, or their devices after two, three years, uh, maybe we have to look at how can we make a rotation uh, in the use faster. Uh, so a car today is used 5% of the time and lives about uh, 15 years. Uh, if we can, by car sharing models, uh, go to an intensively use of a car to only 10%, which is a double, that would mean that we reduce the lifetime of the car from 16 years to eight years. And so we could rotate much faster um, the materials. And that would have an, a positive impact also on the total amount of, of materials in stock in the society. So we could do much more mobility and we could replace and exchange the materials faster than it is today. So car sharing and this kind of models. Yeah, just another thought, another aspect. I think uh, Christina mentioned it already uh, partially. We have uh, a lot of battery chemistries and we have a lot of applications. And the clue is uh, to make the fit between the application and the battery chemistry. What is the best fit for what application? And we see in many applications today that we do have lifetimes of 10 years or more. Uh, which seem to be more than sufficient. Uh, maybe we don't need a second life. Maybe we need a parallel life along the lines of Jan's argument that we have vehicle to grid, that we have second applications during the same lifetime to make better use of the battery uh, and then bring it back to recycling faster. So a mix of picking the best battery for the best application uh, and uh, yeah, using the battery as much as possible to get the best use of it. Uh, I think that would be also very sustainable and uh, that's also market driven. That's also a business case. So you don't need too much of a regulation to do that really. We just need a change of thought maybe. Annika, what are yeah. you? Uh, I, I... I, I want to focus on the first sentence in this uh, statement that we are risking a bit of too much wishful thinking. And I think that is very uh, natural to do. Uh, a regulation with this always comes with trade-offs, which means that we cannot assume that everything is going to continually get bigger and better at, at regardless of what we do. And I think one of the very typical examples here is recycled content. I mean, uh, using recycled content in the battery chemistries that we have today has actually shown that you, at a certain point, you start having uh, a trade-off in performance, which is one of the reasons that uh, uh, bed acid is the big exception, but when it comes to other chemistries, there is a trade-off when the battery performance in, in some aspects start to, to uh, um, become jeopardized. So I think this is something that needs to be explored a lot more. What are the trade-offs that we are actually uh, bringing, to, bringing in with these proposals and with this regulation so that we understand what we are choosing? Because I don't think that is uh, completely clear at this moment. And there is a lot of room for research there. So I really hope that Christina and uh, her colleagues will embrace that challenge. Thank you, Annika. That was the industry view. Now, Fabrice, what are your views on that question? Um, I would agree with everything that was said. Uh, maybe just to uh, say on the, on the lifetime, I mean, we have looked at some data sets and we, we, we know that actually the lifetime of batteries is not that short and, and they are, they are, we've got some good, good uh, lifetime duration for several batteries, so 10 years or even more. Uh, an important point maybe on the, on the short lifetime is also related to collection. We was said that it's important to collect well all this product of these batteries, uh, which are available for collection. So as I said before, there is a need for innovation research, if you want to call it like that, in the implementation of the, of the regulation. And there are some discussions going on indeed for the, for the collection targets. And that's actually in integrating the lifetime of batteries in, in the different applications. So uh, yes, it would be important to, to, to capture this, this lifetime. Okay, and now Claude, you have the final words on that question. Thank you, Emily. So, well, I would take as, as a global industry representative again a pragmatic approach and based on, uh, let's say, general principle that we support, which is indeed, um, we don't know uh, if it is willful thinking or not, if the batteries will have a faster rotation or a much longer life. And it's very difficult to anticipate. 
And then our position would be that we hope that the regulation will just enable both ways to go or third way to go, because uh, we of course may expect innovation on the, on the research side to have no other type of battery that raise different type of questions. But on this uh, question of uh, long duration, uh, particularly also second life or recycling, our approach would be just make a regulation that enable that all type of solution can be selected by the industry and in a sustainable way. And then let the market decide whether recycling has to be privileged to get more cobalt rather than life or the contrary. And frankly speaking, I don't know what the future will say, but what I know is that this should be made in a way that is sustainable in any case and that the regulation I'm not sure, Claude, if we lost you or if it's just me. So your last sentence is missing. I can't hear him anymore. Yeah, the same here. Okay, Claude, I'm really sorry. I think we lost you. But uh, to, to sum it up, I think there were a lot of very interesting questions coming up here today. And as Claude said, we don't have the crystal ball to, to see the future yet. But to end up our uh, round with the quotation that Christina had at the beginning, um, I hope that we will not stay with the candlelight, but find the electricity so that uh, the future of the battery regulation is going into the right direction that it helps industry and that university is having the innovation that the industry needs to go forward. And um, with that, I would really, really um, be keen to give over to Mr. Michael Lippert, who is with us with, for the closing um, statement. And it's an honor to welcome him. He's from the French battery manufacturer Saft and chairman of the recently created Battery European Partnership Association, BEPA. Michael, thank you very much for being with us today. And the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Amelie Sophie, for this introduction. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to conclude this very interesting discussion round. And, and hello and welcome to, to everybody. Well, as you said, uh, BIPA uh, is a very young organization, and I'm, I have the, the honor of being elected chairman uh, back in December last year. BIPA by now gathers more than 160 members. Uh, both from industry and research, by the way, quite 50-50, uh, quite, uh, which, which shows uh, the, the huge interest, but also the resources we have uh, when we try to put together the battery uh, actors in, in Europe. Well, you have understood from Johan that uh, BEPA is an association. It represents the private side of the Battery European Partnership under Horizon Europe. We strive towards a competitive, sustainable, two very important words, battery value chain in, in Europe. So we, we, we try to coordinate, let's say, the global r &I ecosystem in, in Europe and to translate research ambitions into industrial scale marketable activities. I think it has been, uh, has come through in the, in, the, in the discussion that it is very important that we work along the entire value chain. This is quite of new in, in Europe to, to gather the entire value chain. It is clear we don't, uh, it doesn't help us to have a certain technology if we don't have the raw materials or the advanced materials to, to produce it. Uh, and if we don't have the, uh, the manufacturing processes to make this uh, sustainable and, and competitive. So we work from raw materials, through materials, cell battery manufacturing to the end users. And uh, this is very important, both in terms of uh, competitiveness and sustainability. Second point, uh, what we need to do is, uh, of course, to push the innovations to the market. Uh, so to push it to the highest possible level of, of TRL, we have too often seen that developments were stuck uh, somewhere in the in the middle of the of the gorge. So so we need to bring this to the market. And well, I, I we we put this on our agenda to to drive this uh, these two uh, these two points. Coming to the to the topic of today. Um, uh, I think there's a global uh, welcoming of, of, the, of the regulation. Uh, for us at, uh, at BIPA, uh, it is uh, uh, 
it is um, giving us uh, some, some important guidelines. It is important uh, to have these, uh, let's say, strateg strategic uh, orientations. Because as if we say we all agree that batteries need to be sustainable in the future, uh, still, this regulation is important to ensure the entire community that we are working into the right direction, uh, both in terms of market, we are working for electrification, immobility, we are working towards renewables, so the Green Deal is, is, is a big part of it as well. But of course, more specifically, that if we work towards sustainability, uh, that this work will have a value in the future and will find its market in the, in the future, so this is important. But more than that, uh, it precisely defines the parameters and the key performance indicators uh, that should be used. And for us, they serve as, uh, uh, as, as a measurement for our progress as well. So we, we measure uh, the RNI results in the future against these uh, KPIs given through the regulation. So in a, in a nutshell, the regulation gives us the strategic direction gives us the visibility on where the future markets are and uh, for which requirements, and that's important. Nevertheless, the legislation shall not replace, of course, the industrial and technical expertise. Uh, it must refrain from specifying solutions or technical performances as, as such, because industry and research, they must keep the freedom and the level playing field also to invent new solutions. And these solutions, and technologies, first of all, need to satisfy customer and consumer demands. Uh, the, the, the most sustainable, the most reusable, the most recyclable or eco-concept battery will simply not exist if it doesn't find its market and if it is not competitive in the international, in the international context and if it does not match the technical requirements of the application uh, and, the, and the end user. So, Coming back to the discussion today, I think the entire thing, of course, is a question of a well-balanced approach of a, an equilibrium. And, and by the way, as a, as a battery manufacturer, we know quite well what it means to balance cells and, and electricity markets also need to talk about balancing. So now we are at a kind of different level, but we need to have a, a balanced approach between, on the one hand, general principles, which we need, and other, on the other hand, making them meaningful enough so that they can take into account the reality that they give some guidance on how to be implemented, but of course, without uh, restricting the, the liberty and the, the capabilities of the industry. For example, I noticed that there is a difficulty to define sustainability targets in a technical neutral manner, because they may be too general and not applicable or not too differentiated enough for because a lithium battery is not like a, uh, uh, an alkaline battery or, or, or a lead battery. On the other hand, of course, it, it should be general enough to be applicable to today's technologies and to future technologies. The balancing is also between timing. I, we heard this today. Uh, on the one hand, we need a time frame uh, that, that guides us. Uh, it should be challenging. We want to see the results uh, early enough and and, and we want to bring to the market uh, uh, products that are differentiating at a given moment of time. It doesn't help me to say, I will be competi competitive in 10 years of, of time. I want to be competitive and differentiating right now. On the other hand, the timing must be feasible and not be felt too much as a, as a burden or really even, a, uh, even a, a, an economical burden to our industry. Another balancing we need Transparency, of course, we need uh, to, to rely and work on more uh, digitalization and the available data and provide trans transparency. On the other hand, we need to respect that uh, data and information is uh, competitively sensitive and uh, needs to respect, of course, uh, the, the knowledge and the competence of, of each uh, player in, in research and industry. And there is even a balance, my last point, between Inside the, the regulation, the balance between, uh, on the one hand, we want long life and second use, for example, but on the other hand, uh, we want to get the value, critical raw materials back as soon as possible. Uh, so which of the two should we, should we favor? Of course, there is not a silver bullet answer. It's a question of, of 
in my mind of, of, of balancing. And, and this is, uh, again, with, with, without uh, repeating the, the detailed uh, points of this discussion today, this is what I uh, take uh, uh, back from it. Um, please take into account, uh, take into account these, these realities. My uh, request to the, uh, to the lawmakers on the one hand and uh, uh, the, the readiness, I think, from the research and industry side is uh, please try to make this a balanced approach uh, uh, have, have in mind the different constraints. Uh, do not forget that there are consumers and the market, and this is finally what we are working for. And the way of doing this is uh, there, there is not a, a silver bullet, but uh, the result is uh, we have to dialogue and to discuss together uh, to find a consensus. This is a little bit the European way of life. Uh, we do it certainly differently than China or, or other areas. Uh, but it's the way we go, and I uh, personally believe very much in uh, in, in, in this. Um, well, this is my uh, this is my conclusion and uh, and my last word on this very uh, interesting uh, exchange. There are very many interesting questions. Um, I think we, we we tackled most of them, but I would also uh, like to thank all the speakers and, uh, and, and the audience uh, for their interest and the, and the questions we have had. With this, I give it back to you, Amelie Sophie. Thank you, Michael. So yes, we do it the European way, way and uh, we discuss it. And uh, I think we had a very nice discussion today. And as one of the um, members said, the future is electric and batteries play a key role in that. I was just at its sustainable batteries that will play a key role after that discussion that we had today. So ladies and gentlemen, dear speakers, I hope that you enjoyed as much as I did our virtual debate on the battery regulation today. And I also want to thank our event partners, that is Battery 2030 Plus and Recharge as well as all the European Green Week organizers for enabling this meeting. And I also say thank you to our panelists uh, for having the time today and discuss with us. And we also look very much forward to the Green EU Green Week in 2022 and will certainly not stop our work on the new battery rules until then. So I just have to say, stay safe. Thank you for joining and goodbye.